Diaz, everyone. Uh, lovely to see you all. And um, thank you for having me again back in the uh, Balearic Yacht Show, this wonderful, um, let's say, uh, new hybrid event with uh, alongside the Palmer International Yacht Show. That's all very exciting. But unfortunately, um, Boris and the UK government and possibly Brexit stopped me from coming over. Otherwise, I'd love to have been there in the studio or, or just talking to you live from Palmer. I miss Palmer a lot. So listen, I, I, I gave um, a brief introduction um, to Alice as to what I wanted to talk about. And more importantly, to, to, to use this session as almost a, a scene setter for the whole uh, event. What is interesting is, is we're now in, in what I call that unlocking of the, the European markets. Uh, both in terms of the pandemic and both in terms of cruising and the and the sort of the, the future the future pattern of yachting. So what I'm trying to look at is is exactly what could happen in the next eight nine years, ending up in 2030. And why I've used 2030 is because it's that it's that critical deadline for the UN sustainability goals. Uh, and, and we've already had Ria mention sustainability as, as a key topic of of the event, but also of our marketplace. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on. But in context, the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is probably the busiest super yachting destination on the planet. It is the most active marketplace. It has the most infrastructure in the world in terms of refit yards, service centers, and marinas, as well as all the uh, support networks. So that's why it's so critical. But I think what's important is, in context of the world, the Mediterranean is only 0.75% of the world's oceans. So just think about that as a sort of, as a sort of headline topic takeaway. 0.75% of the world's oceans is where we spend most of our time from a super yachting perspective. Now, there are various forecasts and predictions that that will change in terms of how our new customers use yachts in the future. So it's something we'll discuss in a, in a minute, but let's put that 0.75% in context across the European Union and obviously the, the yachting um, sector. You read all the narrative across the EU in Brussels and you read all the narrative across the various environmental and research institutes. The Med is quite dirty at the moment. It's got a lot of pollution, it's not in good health. We've had various propagandas about Posidonia. The population is not exactly taking care of it, more from land side, and pollution coming in via rivers and other sort of means. So it's one thing I think will definitely impact the Mediterranean in the next eight to 10 years, purely because we have to clean up our act. And that's another big topic that will be discussed across the whole um, program, but, but think about it. The most popular cruising destination across our super yacht fraternity and our super yacht marketplace is becoming ill, let's call it, through plastic pollution, overspills, waste, and other chemical impact, which is starting to make sure that we look at this area as being a problem area. And that's coming from Brussels, that's coming from the EU in terms of what can we do to clean up the, the region? What can we do to impose new regulation that will stop us being able to freely move around without having, let's say, controls in place uh, in terms of anchorages, in terms of waste management, and other things that are going to impact how we use boats in the future. So that's a headline topic to think about. The size of the, the region, the impact of our pollution, but also how we use it in the future. That's a key factor of the Mediterranean's um, long-term success. Customers. Let me talk about customers now from a, from a long-term perspective. You're in a space now where we have loads of data around how many yachts there are in the market. All various media companies supply data on number of units. Now, if I break down that market, I'm not gonna share any data. If anyone wants any data, contact me directly, but if anyone needs data, it's loads of it's out there, but it's interpreting data that's critical because if you say there's 5,600 yachts in the world over hundred feet, or you say there's 9,000 yachts over 24 meters, that doesn't really mean anything because it's where those yachts can cruise, which is critical, as well as the age of that fleet. The age of that fleet in terms of their, their, I say, uh, the cruising pattern, their, their, their range, but also their value. There's a lot of yachts that are over 30 years old but in, the, in the smaller category. They're worth less than a million euros. Uh, and these are depreciating assets that, in essence, clog up our marinas because they don't really go very far. They, they do local day cruising or weekend cruising or, or summer holidays, but they're not spending 
like all the big numbers, the big euro dollars uh, into our marketplace. And those, those, that fleet, that aging sort of tired, let's say low depreciated asset fleet becomes almost uh, a negative for our marketplace. And you compound that in with the number of old smaller yachts that clog up our marinas that sit there idle for many, many months of the year. And this is gonna become a future problem. How we handle those older boats in terms of recycling, upcycling, relocating, scrapping, all the things I think will become part of our future between now and 2030, where GRP will be a problem. There's thousands of boats across the Mediterranean sitting there who are rotting GRP hulls that need to be managed. And to me, that's one of the fundamental things that from a freedom of space needs to be tackled by government, needs to be tackled regionally. And I think the Marina Investor Network will also want to tackle it from the point of view of the next, the next future client base. Because client base is what I'm talking about. We estimate in the large space of 30 meters plus active super yachts, the real yachts that we all want to sort of service and look after, there are 3,000 plus active owners. So by 2030, what's going to happen? We, we are confident as, a, as an industry, and when you talk to the various players in the market, that we will grow consistently based on current shipyard capacity at a rate of 120 to 130 units per year minimum. If we capitalize on that client-based potential, it could accelerate. We're hearing stories from some of the production builders, the larger production builders who are building 30 meter boats that orders are getting really exciting because finance is cheap. You can now borrow for 20 years at a very low interest rate and with a finance deal, that means actually it costs peanuts for some of these ultra high net worth clients to buy a 100 foot, 90 foot production boat um, um, asset. So we can see this acceleration growing because the pandemic exposed yachting as being a safe, secure experience. However, marina in infrastructure, if you look at the marina infrastructure, we're looking at a situation where there are so many marinas out there that need upgrades or that need to be fit for purpose in the future. Um, we've seen lots of investors coming. We've seen lots of people repurpose marinas for the larger fleet, but it's not a consistent flow. It's not a consistent process. We certainly need to look at this from the point of view of where are we heading in terms of the need to upgrade and improve marina infrastructure for what is going to be the future fleet. And by the future fleet, I mean, there are so many yachts that are existing vessels with conventional propulsion and all the various predictable levels of the yacht space. What we're seeing today, and, what we're, and, and this is why I'm putting this in context, by 2030, that's essentially two new build cycles in our marketplace, maybe taking a four year cycle as being designed to completion. So that's only two build cycles before we get to 2030. What's being designed and delivered or built and designed today is gonna to be very different to what we have in the fleet now. We're looking at hybrid, looking at dual fuel, we're looking at new fuels, we're looking at alternative fuels, we're looking at high tech new systems, we're looking at different technology, we're looking at maintenance profiles using AI. The market is changing so dramatically behind the scenes that by the time we get to 2030, we're not just talking about repaints and checking the, uh, the hull, we're looking at really high-tech systems on board yachts, which we need to make sure the marinas and the reefer infrastructure is ready for that future fleet. Purely because to, to look after a hybrid or a, um, a next generation fuel, be it hydrogen or be it any other sort of fuel system that people are talking about today, by 2030, we'll need a network of marinas that have that infrastructure, not only to support the energy systems, because let's face it, the majority of yachts, even across the, the wider network of yachts, spend a, a high, high percentage of their time in port, in marinas. So that's something we have to plan for. We have to plan for that new generation of high-tech yachts. We have different power requirements um, to make sure they have got the infrastructure in place. So that, that's an interesting subject to think about from a marina perspective. What are we doing? What are we investing in to make sure the next generation of yachts absolutely have 
the services ashore to su support them. Then on top of that, the size of yachts. We're seeing this wonderful sort of evolution of 60 to 150 meter boats. There are, there are called these exciting mega projects that are being discussed and, and develop, developed. Now, one of the things we have to consider in the Mediterranean for these larger yachts is not only the marina infrastructure, not only the shore power and the various services they may require at another level almost, a higher level of service, we have to think about their cruising pattern. We have to think about where they can go. And the other part of the Mediterranean's future problem is regulation. Where can they anchor? Where can they actually cruise flexibly, freely, without regulation, without these restrictions, without the whole topic of anchoring 30, in 30 meter depth of water or more only because of Posidonia or because of other environmental impact restrictions. This is gonna change the way yachts operate. This is gonna change the way yachts perceive the Mediterranean. We know this is all positive stuff for the water, for the economic and the environmental impact, but we have to consider those larger yachts, if they can't move around flexibly and freely as their customers expect because if you're at that level of ownership in a larger larger vessel you need to have freedom that's what you're buying so we have to manage this in terms of getting ashore from a an anchorage that may be half a mile away or a mile away whichever the the anchorage um setups will be in the future but we can expect we can almost predict that the, e the EU and the various regional regulations will change as to where yachts can cruise and how they can move freely. Look at the, uh, the various environmental zones that have been developed across the world. That's bound to come into the Mediterranean based on what we've seen in research on the impact of the pollution, et cetera, on our waters. So these are things to be aware of long term. This means that agents, marinas, and the various infrastructure support companies We'll have to look at this from a point of view, how can we service, how can we support those yachts? Put that in context also of some of the smaller yachts below 45 meters, who may have to anchor in 30 meters of water or, or more. That's in some cases a long way offshore. So therefore small tenders on some of those 30 meter boats may have to be rethought, or you have different types of shuttle services for bringing guests ashore, because if the wave con conditions aren't right, getting guests ashore from a long range anchorage position because of these regulations will not work. It'll be an uncomfortable, unpleasant experience. And all we're trying to do is deliver the best experience possible. So these are things we have to look at. Refit infrastructure, I mentioned several times. Um, competition is growing. There are new facilities being looked at all across the Mediterranean. There's new facilities being looked at in the wider world. Northern, Northern, Northeast America, Florida obviously is a fairly in, in significant part of the infrastructure. We look at what's happening in the Asia Pacific region. We even look at the Eastern Mediterranean. There's so many things happening which are suggesting that the refit infrastructure is becoming a buzzword, let's call it, of upgrading and becoming more focused on adding more refit capacity. That there's two things that, and I'll obviously add that to the new build market, adding refit services to their portfolio. What we have to be aware of is two things. One is this capacity needs to be managed in terms of not by the industry, but by each company that not everyone has to chase the 60 meter plus market. It doesn't make sense. When you look at the size of that fleet, only about a thousand plus yachts over 45 meters have been delivered in the last 30 years. So not everyone can service that fleet. But more importantly, those yachts need high levels of service, high levels of capacity. Now we need to make sure that capacity is at the highest level in terms of manpower, in terms of project managers, in terms of employees who know what they're doing on a very expensive asset. It's not just a matter of going into a yard in the middle of nowhere and all these guys walk on board in their hobnail boots and start ripping things out to, to redo the interior with some North European subcontractors. We have to look at this in terms of the, the fit for purpose capacity that services the needs of what it will be an expanding fleet. So, so that's, that's a key element of the future of the Mediterranean. Where are we going in terms of the amount of capacity that's being developed that is gonna be very competitive and may even uh, change the landscape in terms of quality of refit. Um, we've got high quality, very local premium refit centers like in the Balearics, like in Barcelona, like in Marseille, like in Genoa, uh, 
but there's others who are emerging in these new territories across in the Eastern Mediterranean that are trying to sort of win business. Um, but the expertise and the quality of service is something we have to be aware of or manage as, a, as an industry to make sure that yachts are not being uh, downgraded rather than upgraded. Okay, so that leads me to another topic, which I think is also very important from a market perspective in terms of the future of the Mediterranean. Now, 2030, as I mentioned, is, is eight, nine years away. Now, in eight, nine years time, a lot of our industry leaders, industry experts, and what I call the most experienced people operating the fleet, that is the senior level of, of captains and, and uh, senior officers, are going to head into what I call their twilight years. So we need to know that we have a very robust next generation of people coming through who understand and know and have the expertise and the knowledge to make sure this fleet operates effectively. Because we're going to lose some of that expertise as people move out of the market, retire, or the, the other mortal coil they fall off. So we end up with a situation we need to develop manpower. We need to develop people who really understand this market for the future, because the demand on this new fleet that will grow in the next nine, 10 years will be in excess of 20,000 potential crew that will be needed to run that fleet. And that leaves vacuums in other parts of the sector. On top of that, if you look at the, um, the, the refit service and the agents and the port and the marinas, they need a whole new generation of people too. So we're gonna see this sort of demand equation for the future employees of our marketplace becoming a key issue we have to manage because the Mediterranean is about service, is about support. And we need to make sure we have the people uh, with the right skills and the right capacity and the right knowledge to service this next generation of yachts. And I say that also from a crew perspective, as yachts get more high tech, as yachts get more complex, we need a different type of crew member. It's no longer just the guy that, girl, guy washing down the decks and doing all that sort of daily maintenance. We need very high tech employees who are engineers and technicians and let's say electronic sort of wizards who understand how to run the boat. Now, it's very easy to see that becoming a problem as other industries suck out of that skill set into their, into their sectors. Okay. So I've mentioned about future technology. I've mentioned about sort of the next generation of customers. We don't really know yet what the next generation of customers really want because they're starting to emerge and discuss what they are thinking. And I think when we look at the, 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 sort of the, the tech billionaires or the next generation, the younger billionaires, we have to be prepared for two things. One is that they are going to be buying or building or owning yachts that are not just to sit at anchor off uh, Ibiza or off uh, Formentera or maybe off in some of the other uh, islands across the Mediterranean, but they may want to go further afield. They may want to go and discover the world. There's loads of rhetoric at the moment in the market about explorers. And to be honest, when you put the 0.75% of the Mediterranean in context with the rest of the world's oceans, there's a lot of space to explore. There's a lot of places to discover, but I'm not convinced that the idea of going to the Antarctic or Arctic or, or wherever is going to be enough of a draw card or enough of an attraction, because you may go there, you may say, wow, this is amazing, look at all that wonderful white ice, but there's very little else you can do there. Um, there's also other issues that you have to manage in terms of infrastructure and support and, and security. So it's, it's going to be a, a, a voyage of discovery, but I think it'll be very short term. I think people return back to what I call the conventional cruising grounds, where it is easy to, easy to understand the parameters you're cruising in. But it's concerns, it concerns me or part of our research team is that maybe people who buy yachts for the first time or go into yachting for the first time and don't quite understand what it's all about and the cost of ownership, et cetera, may say, actually, for the amount of time, this is an important point, we are seeing that owners are using their boats only about 10% of their annual life cycle. So when you look at the cost of ownership versus that 10% of life cycle, you can almost expect this shift to take place in the next five, six, seven, eight years, where people say, actually, I don't really need a yacht for 365 days of the year. 
I just need a yacht for my 10% of the year. And therefore we expect, and we probably are fairly confident to predict that the charter industry, the, the usage and the, the, the um, availability of the fleet from a charter perspective will be a significant driver of our future marketplace. And I won't talk about charter too much because there's another session on charter, but I would like to sort of sow that seed that the most intelligent way of using a boat from an owner's perspective, if you're only using it for a short amount of time, seems to be pointing in the direction of using a boat only on a part-time basis on demand. And that is really where the private jet world has gone. And we've talked about this for many years about when will that happen? I think we'll see that happen in the next, between now and 2030 as being a shift in the marketplace into intelligent usage. So that changed the way yachts will operate, where they're based. And so that will allow people like the Balearics to create a super hub where yachts are based for occupancy in very, very short term ownership programs like an, an FBO type approach in uh, the private jet world. You have hubs, super hubs where yachts are based for uh, deployment to, to clients who want to use the boats on these on demand bases. So I think that's an interesting sort of dynamic for the future of the market. Anyway, I'm going to quickly, quickly whiz through. I've got about another 10 minutes left to, to sort of talk about this. I talk about the, the migration patterns. We have seen some of the larger fleet. We have seen a lot of yachts move out of the Mediterranean. I remember doing a, a, a presentation many years ago in Australia called The Med is Dead. And I meant that in a, in a very sort of um, uh, direct, candid way is that when you swim in the Mediterranean, I, obviously I'm in the Med every summer, it's like you look at that sort of underwater environment, and this is why all these Posidonia rules are coming in, you, you're seeing that the Med has been damaged um, by pollution and by all the various other environmental impacts that underwater is not very exciting. And, and all these yachts have got dive rooms and scuba gear and everything you can imagine to get underwater. But there's very few locations in the Mediterranean that actually deliver that perfect experience. Some exist, but it's not, in, not as much as the rest of the world has. So you can almost see that diving and the underwater exploration thing will become something that drives migration, going to discover incredible locations beyond the Med. But I still am very confident that when you look at the fleet, the fleet we're building today, and this is another thing about migration, there was a presentation recently by FedShip on their unique um, TV channel, which was, which was very interesting. The, the typical cruising distance that a yacht is taking in the, in the 45 meter plus market, the typical cruising distance that a yacht is taking is no more per voyage of 30 nautical miles when guests are on board. And that almost dictates and predicts that Cruising, long range cruising is not a guest experience. It is basically an, an A to B experience for the crew to get the boat to the right location. But guests are not moving very far. So when you get out of the Mediterranean, this is the, this is the point, the distances between pa cruising patterns and locations may be too far for the guest experience to be comfortable. Because if you're not used to long range cruising above 100 nautical miles or something, um, at, at sort of 14, 15 knots and the wave patterns aren't quite comfortable, I don't think people enjoy the long range cruising that the rest of the world dictates. So we may end up with that typical pattern of hopping from coast to coast at what I call very conventional um, sh short range speeds, very uh, relaxed cruising of the Mediterranean, the, the bygone era of of sort of hopping from port to port or anchorage to anchorage. So I think that's the really positive element that the Med is designed for very short range hopping from island to island or port to port or bay to bay. And I think that's our unique selling point. And I feel this is why the Mediterranean becomes the number one destination. It's accessible, obviously from all the various major cities. It has wonderful <coughs> flight infrastructure. But on top of that, you end up being uh, in, in areas you understand and you know. But what we have to do is balance this with what's happening across a regulation, but also the absolute congestion we're going to see with all these new yachts coming in, even below 100 feet. Because if you look at all the production builders, they're building pretty active um, fleet numbers as well. So 
the market is going to keep getting more and more congested across the Mediterranean. So we have to plan for that. We have to plan not in terms of number of births available, but how we can support and service those different segments of a marketplace. The old fleet, the new small fleet, and the ever-growing super um, high-tech fleet. They're not all the same customer, not all the same demands, they're not all the same expectations. You take, you take a, a billionaire on their 80, 90 meter um, super yacht, they want to have privacy, but they also, in some cases, want to make sure they are not surrounded by um, lots of small boats and have all that disturbance. So we've got to make sure they have that um, support and privacy and infrastructure available to them to make sure the, okay, this is an interesting subject. If you're, if you're owning a 90 meter boat or an 80 meter boat of a very high tech and also very expensive asset level, typically that yacht will have multiple toys on board, which are very expensive limousines, tenders, et cetera. Those are invariably more expensive than some of the 30 meter float, fleet. Getting those large tenders ashore with guests on board is sometimes a logistical headache because the ports and the marinas and the, and the, and the docks are not designed to receive 5 million euro plus tenders alongside an old dock or alongside an old rusty sort of tire um, fested um, sort of port somewhere in the Greek islands or, or wherever. So we have to think about that as to how we can get these assets and these individuals ashore safely to make sure that infrastructure is ready for what they call the, the VVVIP. So the, these are interesting topics. The final point in terms of the, the Mediterranean um, uh, sort of future, and it's been talked about a lot, and I, I talk about environmental, I talk about emission control areas, I talk about the fact that, that the various environmental impacts coming from Brussels and other various uh, UN sort of goals will impact how we cruise, will impact how people discharge grey water or sewage. That's a big topic that needs addressing as the Mediterranean, because that will challenge how captains and crew and managers can operate the fleet. The final point I want to just reinforce, and there's a, there's a couple of sessions which I'm sure discuss this, is there is a real issue across the Mediterranean that's called bureaucracy. And I feel that if we can look at this as a very hot topic of the future uh, and try to impose or improve that sort of um, uh, seamless, well-connected, joined-up thinking across the Mediterranean, where captains, managers, and crew are not burdened with paperwork across borders and across different jurisdictions, but we create um, logical, intelligent systems, digital systems even, where there is a transfer of information that's seamless via apps or via technology that allows people to move freely, both crew and guests because it becomes a headache, it becomes a distraction. It, makes, it takes away the fun of moving from the Balearics to the Greek islands and all the various territories in between. That paperwork element, that administrative headache that is created by this burden is making, let's say, the, the world of the yacht captain and the world of the crew actually uh, very, very difficult to sort of manage. And, in essence, we know how we can move freely between Schengen countries. Obviously, I'm now you know, being excluded from Europe, uh, being part of the Brexit situation. But you look at how you can get around Schengen areas comfortably by having these joined up logical processes. You look at IMO FAL forms in, in the real shipping world, in the real world of operations. Why can't we bring into the market in the next five, 10 years an intelligent way of getting people to move across the Mediterranean so that everyone has the freedom of movement. And we end up with something that takes away that complexity and makes it more expensive, makes it more difficult and removes what I call that freedom, that spontaneity to get into different locations without having all that, um, let's say, the, the stuff you have to think about, the stuff you have to think about that's unnecessary. So, you look at going from Italy to Greece to Croatia, all these things are painful. And I think the agents obviously are there to help, but in terms of a, an EU or a Mediterranean pass, a med pass, it's certainly one of the things I think will certainly change the way in which we approach yachting going forward. There's too much bureaucracy that stops 
or in, interferes or distracts people from doing what they're supposed to do. That's, that's driving, driving a, a yacht for a very, very successful individual or family and make them have the most incredible experience in the Mediterranean. Bureaucracy stops that fun for everyone on board. Uh, and I think these are things we really have to address as an industry and at an EU level, but also as a regional government level to say, can we start looking at this as a subject to, to improve the restrictions, to reduce the restrictions? And so we end up with a more transparent uh, freedom of movement across our region. And then there's other things that I think are, are certainly, I, I spoke to a couple of captains about this subject. There's, there's, there's certain things that I think we, we, we have to look at from a point of view of um, the Mediterranean. I mentioned that the, 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 the tender is getting bigger, but I've also mentioned before this environmental topic, which I, I think is one, one thing I just need to sort of bring up. We as an industry on board yachts have a discipline of waste management. We are, the crew are almost passionate and, and, and focused on sorting waste, managing garbage, and making sure that they, when they come ashore, they have delivered excellent separation of garbage. It's, it's a very sort of, as I say, it's not a sexy topic, but it's an important topic. And it's some important topic from the wider Mediterranean topic uh, to look at. And I think the Balearics, we had this conversation last year about the Balearics becoming a green hub. If you come ashore as a crew member or as a captain, and you deliver your sorted garbage ashore, and you deliver all this wonderful time that's happened on board to make sure your separated rubbish is in the protocoled um, uh, levels, and it goes ashore and the local authorities or the regional waste management company just puts all in the same place in, in uh, shoreside, it leaves a very bad taste in the mouth of the crew. And I feel we have to make sure that the garbage management for all this fleet across the Mediterranean between now and 2030, when these UN sustainability goals kick into action, all these regulations will come into play. We need to make sure garbage separation ashore is married with the garbage separation on yachts. So we have that joined up approach. Okay, and um, I think the other thing I just, uh, just mentioned on, on, on the sort of closing argument of this whole topic is that um, we have to make sure as an industry across the Mediterranean, um, we're ending up in a marketplace where it's not just about the wealthiest people on the planet with their toys. Because as I mentioned earlier on, if they're only spending 10% of the year, um, let's say, using those assets, cruising around, they're very rarely sitting in port with guests on board. They're always an anchor or cruising around in their short range cruising. We have to make sure that every hub, every location, every major so a super yacht infrastructure base across the Mediterranean has a clear focus on two things. When guests are not on board, looking after the crew. The crew work when guests are on board incredibly hard, unbelievably hard. And I feel that one of the things we have to look at is how those crew are, say, serviced, let's call it, or looked after when they're actually in port. And, and they have that sort of, V I call it a VIP status because without the crew, without the people operating the boats, things don't happen on, uh, in our marketplace. So we have to look after them. We have to make sure we're developing a, a real service infrastructure that the crew feel special, the crew feel wanted uh, and, and are looked after. Um, there's various stories over the years where crew have been targeted by local uh, individuals for being these elite individuals who, who are open targets for muggings or other petty crime. So we have to look at this as something that we, we try to build into the culture across the Mediterranean that without crew, yachts don't operate and guests don't get on board and guests don't spend the money. Because when guests are on board or guests are in the region, um, we know the economic impact is measured in millions, not just thousands of dollars. And I think these are things we have to make sure we build as part of the, the future thought process. The other thing we have to do on a regional basis and, and, and what I call this a local government basis, is to, and this, is, this I think is, is, is a fundamental part, we've done lots of research on this for regions across the Mediterranean, is the, the, the local authorities, the local governments absolutely have to understand that yachts are a positive impact. 
It's not just the toys of the wealthy or toys of the ultra, ultra wealthy. Yachts have a positive impact on these local authorities. And we need to make sure all the various sort of um, regional government departments and regional supply chains, et cetera, appreciate the value of yachting so that they actually embrace yachting and don't necessarily see it as a negative. And that's been part of what I call the, the next phase of our industry to explain the real value um, of, of what yachting brings to the table and, and how yachts spend money and making sure that everyone who's even on the cusp of yachting, be it a taxi driver, florist or whatever, they appreciate the value. They don't see it as just a billionaire's toy, they see it as an ecosystem that actually delivers unbelievable value across all locations in the Mediterranean. And I think that that's really what I want to try and get across. I think we're, we're a positive spin, a positive closing comment, because I think I'm running out of time now. The positive comment at the end, the pandemic has been a nightmare for so many people. And we know that it's, it's, it's not over yet. But if you analyze the last 15 months, and you analyze exactly what's happened across the world, stock markets and investments and the liquidity, the amount of money that has been made in the last 15 months from various let's say, systems and structures, investments and market growth, et cetera, is incredibly exciting. The number of ultra high net worth, as I mentioned earlier on, is climbing every single year at ridiculous rates. So our potential marketplace and our potential client base is on a very positive tra trajectory because people, and all the brokers have confirmed this, and the designers confirmed this, people are asking about yachting as being the safe haven. So I can see the future being very positive and partly pandemic driven, partly people waking up to the fact that yachting is not a, a, a bad thing. But ultimately, um, if you look at the pandemic impact across Europe and, and especially from an economic perspective, and you look at the, 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 the let's call it this big rhetoric about wealth inequality, we can almost expect that they will be looked at even more rigorously in the future from authorities and from government. So we have to manage this and, and explain and present to government, to present to people the value, not only of our yacht industry and the yacht, the yacht impact, economic impact, but there's a lot of work to be done that's my time up, sorry. Uh, a lot of work has to be done looking at how our customers, how our end clients make an impact too. Because every billionaire or every ultra high net worth individual, they make a huge impact in so many different ways. We are not serving the needs of corrupt, bad people, gangsters or drug dealers. We're serving the, 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 sort of the, the needs and the expectations and the, the experiences of people who run the most important companies in the world who drive employment and revenues and tax dollars at every single level. We need to make sure yachting has a positive vibe and a positive impact. And the, our perception and our image is changed uh, because uh, in the current landscape, we're looked at as being the, the, play, the playground of the filthy rich. We need to make sure we're the playground of the cleanest, greenest, wealthiest people on the planet. And I think on that note, I, I, look, I, wish, I wish you all good, good, good success at the Bellary Yacht Show, and I thank you for your time, and I, I enjoyed sort of showing my views of what could happen in the next eight, 10 years, and 2030 is a very critical period in our land, uh, landscape. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll see you again soon.